the event's been good. I think this is my favorite Secret Cup that we've done out of all of them. Secret Cup, it's one of those special events, you know? It's a secret, you really can't, can't tell people too much about it, you know? Can't say none. Uh, this has been a dream of mine to be able to do these events. It's super, super great to be able to Thanks, dream up something like this and then sit back and, and see it come to fruition like it has. All right, smile, I'm taking videos. <laughs> it was taking some scary ass risks. It really was. But the reward was great because it felt like we carved out a little piece of the world and made it exactly how we wanted to for a little while. In the grinder, in your cranky. In bed with Mary, you can find her in my blanket. You got fire, I'ma blaze it. Call it rise to the occasion. Fat shatter patties, butter drying in the basin. I don't need no provocation to smoke. My occupation's the toe. Even though it's also making me broke. Come on, Barack Obama, gotta lend some change with a stroke of a pen. Quit persecuting all of those you're supposed to defend. How to be taking tokes of the sour D hourly gone like a falcon on the balcony. I'm dripping when I'm out of weed. I need a Buddha sack, that pre 98 bubba headband, a super jack rolling, never get far. Opening the fresh jar, little Skywalker choking on the Death Star. Spoiled bragger, E Nail coil rapper, royal shadow rapper, spitting hotter than my oil spat. The Seeker Cup is a cannabis judging contest that puts the voting power in the hands of the people who know cannabis best, the growers and concentrate makers themselves. Most people already know that cannabis grows from a seed, but the part of the plant we use for medicine comes primarily from the oil in the trichomes which are formed on the outside of the flowers and leaves. Hashish is simply oil extracted from the flowers and leaves. Trichomes can be separated many ways. The oldest is to use a sifting technique to separate the resin heads and make what is commonly called keef. One of the most popular extraction techniques is to use low heat and pressure to simply squish the oil out of the buds, keef, or water hash and make rosin. Water hash is made using a system of bags filled with ice, water, and cannabis. The contents are carefully stirred to separate out the plant material from the trichomes. Once properly dried and cured, water hash results in a quality product. Hash oils have become one of the most desired cannabis extracts to true connoisseurs. Usually made with common solvents and involves a closed looped extraction process. Often called oil, shatter, wax, or butter, these products have proven both the safety and effectivity of cannabis as a universal medicine. While the recipe is simple, the results are amazing. The Secret Cup is the only competition where the extract makers are the judges, coming together as a community and sharing techniques with their peers to advance their craft before ultimately deciding whose entry is the international champion. I guess for me, the Seeker Cup is many things. It has become a way that I get to celebrate with my friends. And so we have a family. <laughs> nice job, Pius. Yeah, so I started making hash. Um, I'm, I'm actually a grower, been in the industry for since solidly 1998. like a lime taste. It's good, but it's, it's just kind of low in taste. I got this inspiration by coming the, to the cup, to the Secret Cup in 2012, and I took last place, man, and it it uh, burned inside of me like no other. And I, met, I was around a bunch of guys that were from my area that were probably like the best hash makers on the planet, you know, like, and it just was super inspiring being around them and um, haven't really looked back. <laughs> I have been making hash since I was a kid. We would grow outdoor and because of the climate uh, and where we were at, we weren't getting very dense nugs. And so what we would end up doing is hashing it because that was the only way we could make any money off of what we grew. So that's how it kind of started. And then it just progressed from there. I ended up preferring hash 
to, uh, to flowers um, just because it really lets me know where the terpene profile stands and, and where the grower was at when he, when, he made his, when he made his product. You know, it lets me know everything about the grower, you know, just from the taste, flavor. And so, you know, that's, that's why I prefer hash. That and, and, and it's a health thing, you know, less is more you know, when it comes to hash and, and you don't end up smoking flowers all day long, every day stinking and, and wasting your time. You know, you take a dab and it's done. My favorite thing about the Seeker Cup is the friends and the people that have, and they're all from different areas in the country, but we can all keep in, in, in touch on the internet or whatever. And uh, we all share an unhealthy obsession with dabbing, the culture that surrounds it. This is a real organic, community experience. This is done with a lot of effort, a lot of love. There's something here that you won't find in the corporate element of other events. It doesn't really have that feel of people trying to make money. It more or less has the feel of a community trying to really become more tight-knit and um, a group of purists trying to really find the best product and the more, most healthiest product out there. Uh, my name's Doug Dracup, and I own Hitman Glass, and I also throw Chalice Festival. Big round of applause for uh, Hitman Glass and Chalice. Yeah. I'm supporting Daniel and Jeremy and uh, this whole elaborate thing they've created. Uh, I've definitely been there from the earlier stages, you know, attending a lot of their events. Events like this progress the movement because really nobody else is doing anything like this. We strive for uh, perfection in our work, but at, at the Seeker Cups, there's a little bit more of a, uh, I don't know, like a brotherhood where we can talk about things and share our tech rather than try to um, port it or uh, keep it as like a secret society or something that. To me, the, the Seeker Cup is my family, not just my friends. Um, where, wherever we are, if you catch the vision and you're a part of it, then, then you're, you're part of the family. And, and Hydro, just as an artist supporting the Seeker Cup with the Seeker Cup anthem, it's awesome. I know everybody yeah. loves it, so thank you for the anthem as well. Welcome to the Cup. I'm so glad that you made it from LA to NY. We all getting faded. For me, it's really family, you know? Having all the people come together from all the different cities. Every cup, it's something bigger, it's something better. It's, uh, it's people helping each other out to get the stuff on another level, you know? People aren't holding back the tricks really much, and, and that's what's cool about it. Well, like I said, family, family, family. Oh, you're on film, dude, you're not posing. Oh. And we get to celebrate the things that we love, the, the culture of cannabis, concentrates and all the good things that we want to see go further in the community. It was like summer camp for hash makers. It was like the the best symposium we could come up with. It's cool that the event kind of grew with the movement, you know, and it grew at the times. It's really developed into its own beast. Um, I go to all types of weed events all over the world. All these guys are my friends and family, really. Uh, I've been attending almost every Secret Cup since the inception, and I've also performed at several of them or hosted others. So I've been involved in, in one capacity or another for a lot of the shows, but I can't take credit for any of it. It's all definitely Jeremy and Daniels. I'm really, really happy that we were able to do the event here in such an amazing venue. We were really, really lucky to have the people that helped us last year kind of line it up. That's Fields and Oli and, and the whole staff here, Ron, everybody's been awesome. So I, I would love to come back and do a lot more here. There's a certain joy that comes from experiencing superior work. So it's for the connoisseurs and it's for the patients. So I'm really happy to give this award to we actually took first place last year, so that was out of control for us. And um, I love this, man. Like I said, it's just to be around all my brothers and sisters. I work a lot right now, so to get to enjoy this and be around family, and like, it's awesome. It's, it's the best. Bringing everybody together, you know, it's somebody's cool house and we're hanging out and you're just chilling like you're with your friends at home, you know? I like being able to meet people on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Sometimes when you meet someone in their booth, they're so riddled with other people and, and stress and everything that they got going on, it's hard to 
get on a personal basis with someone and really talk to them about their tech or what they're doing or or how where they stand in the oil industry or even in the in the cannabis industry period and when it's a much more personal level like this and you have a lot more time to hang out with everyone and hear where they come from and hear their story you meet a lot of great people from all around the world that you never would have had the chance to meet and you know that's that's probably one of the better things about um, the nationals is that here in vegas you know you have the top three from every region around the world essentially the 20 best hash makers in the united states and you know to have them all sit down at the same table and compare each other's stuff in and of itself is is just making history in the cannabis movement fuck yeah i think we're the best you know maybe not me but the group of people are probably hands down the best you know i'm a very lucky person i get to travel all over the, the country and now the world doing these competitions, bringing like-minded people together. It's such a joy to be able to experience all these different places and all these different people. We, we don't make a lot of money, but the, the experiences we get in being able to go to the event ourselves that we want to go to, even though we had to create it, uh, is priceless. It's the thing I'm most proud of in life. I want to thank Haggard for just DJing for like two days straight and never ending DJ. I think Jeremy has a few thank yous too we wanted to throw out there before we start announcing the winners. Myself and Daniel met at a dispensary. It was called Kind Meds. They were the premier dispensary for concentrates in the valley at the time. When I was growing up, the, there was a definite stigma against cannabis. Uh, my mother, she was a smoker and was actually smoking until she was about five months pregnant but my grandmother was definitely against it, even though she owned a bar. When I moved from Arizona to California to live with her, she broke it down for me to like, see that bench right there in Blythe? Me and your stepdad smoked a joint there. And at first it was completely shocking to me, the fact that she, my mother smoked pot, you know? But for the next five years I was living with her and you know, got very exposed to it. And, and yeah, like, I, I never really, had a stigma after I was nine years old. I mean, it was just a part of regular life. So there were no brand names or companies known for cannabis. There were strains that you'd heard about, like Maui Waui was this famous Hawaiian strain or Thai stick. When you're going to buy cannabis in the old days, it was like good bud or bad bud, cheap or expensive. There were not a lot of choices and it wasn't the same every time you went back to the same person even. Sometimes they would have this, sometimes they would have that. You got a little bit of variety, but they were limited in what they grew or who they were able to get from too. So we didn't have any of the brands here in the United States. When you went overseas though, they had seed companies and coffee shops. So certain genetics started to come from people who had established themselves in Amsterdam and other places as seed companies. And the strains they came out with would generate recognition and those would become sought after as well. But even then, from grower to grower, the plants can be very different, even though it's the same genetics. And even from seed to seed of the same strain, they can be very different. Your experience with cannabis was very limited and very unique, if you were even able to get some of this stuff. So as cannabis grew and became more of a mainstream thing, now you saw it was easier to establish and popularize a brand. Then the change went away from the emphasis being really the genetics and now it's more the brands with certain genetics being associated with those brands. It's really fascinating. It was all uh, in college for me. See, when I was 16 years old, I was living in a foster home. I joined a Christian fundamentalist church and was in there until I was 19 years old. And then uh, when I was 19 years old, I decided that, you know, I, I met a girl and I decided I wanted to be with her and not with the church. So. I, uh, I left it. There was this weird kid who was an obvious stoner. Um, <clears throat> I was about to cross the street and he was crossing the street too. And he was, and we ran into each other. He was like, hey, can you try to buy us some beer at this store? We were both 19. And I'm like, sure, I'll give it a shot. I walk right in there. I get his 240s and come out and he's like, hey, I, I want to roll up this blunt. You know, do you want to smoke? And I'm like, yeah. So we go back to his apartment. Um, he got one of those giant cigars and an ounce of swag, and he broke it all up, pulled the seeds and stems out, and rolled the fattest blunt, smoked half of it, slept on his couch like for two days, and I just woke up, and I think I've smoked every weed every single day since. <laughs> I 
Look at that guy go, lungs of steel. After his philosopher's stones and everything. Cannabis helped me socially tremendously. I wasn't one of the popular kids growing up. And all I ever wanted was to just be one of the cool kids. For the longest time, I did not embrace being different. I saw it as a negative thing. Growing up, not being part of the in crowd, knowing that I was different from everybody else, it was a struggle. As I smoked cannabis, I started to realize that being different could be something really cool and really special. And I was able to have this life that I had dreamed about growing up and travel all over the world, do all these crazy things. And that was all because of cannabis. I think for me, um, it was the entire lifestyle of it. I sold weed because, you know, I was a foster kid that went straight into a university and lived on financial aid. And I wanted to smoke and have fun and, you know, live like the other college kids. So this afforded me the opportunity to do it. What I liked about it the most is how it just brought so many different people together. Like, you know, when you're 18, 19 years old, you have these sessions where, you know, you have black people, white people, people from Korea that are exchange students, people from Europe that are exchange students, you know, all together smoking weed. And it was really cool and it was really fun and it was really nice. And I felt like I was on the path to some sort of, like, some sort of thing, something was coming. Come on, shatter kids, it doesn't like to stick to a fucking dabber. <laughs> so if you get shattered in your eye, who's gonna sue me? I don't have that much money. The idea for the secret cup came from a trip that I took to California right after I won um, first place the Denver High Times Medical Cannabis Cup for Concentrate. It gave me a little bit of notoriety and I was doing well financially, so I took a trip all up and down the coast. When I went to San Jose, I was hanging out with a bunch of people that uh, were part of this group online called Extract Artists. You know, we were talking about cups and we wanted to make the best event possible. So one thing that we decided was, you know, we really had to have qualified people judging it. And then we decided that the most qualified people of all would be um, actual extract artists. The first secret cup, Daniel was throwing it. When I went to cover the, the event at his house, I realized he was overwhelmed and I started helping out right away. Being the person that I am in, in the industry, I've been on a, a lot of different teams and I can recognize something as truly wonderful and, and truly special when I see it. And I immediately recognized that the Seeker Cup was going to be something very special, that the people who were entering were different. They weren't the typical people that enter a lot of these other events. The idea came, sort of evolved into, you know, the actual, you know, competitors would be judging the people they were competing against. Because <clears throat> the fact is, I wanted to make it educational. I want everyone who competes to learn. I want them to see what's possible. I want them to see what they're competing against. And, uh, you know, if they need to, just change what they're doing to be better. The whole sentiment of the competition was not the same. There was almost a level of sharing and, and camaraderie that was part of this competition versus like a typical competition was very like segregated and tribal, you know, I'm versus you were, were enemies. But at the Seeker Cup, people were sharing ideas. They were talking about these concepts in a different way. It was kind of to raise the bar for everyone. It, it's kind of my legacy. It's kind of like what I'm trying to do. Uh, I won a lot of prizes and uh, contests previously. And I find that I like giving out the prizes even better than I like winning them. Just because it's fun to be able to find new talent in something. And uh, a lot of the hash makers that are doing really well today and making great products um, were not discovered by the Secret Cup, but you know, that was the first contest they ever won. When I saw that in Colorado at the first Secret Cup, I told Daniel, I said, I want to do this in Los Angeles. Our community was potentially deeper and doing better work than the work they were doing in Colorado. And I wanted to showcase that right away. You know, I had been to the Amsterdam Cannabis Cups many times and a common sentiment when you're going there from California 
is that you're not very impressed with the quality of cannabis or the quality of hash or you know the quality of a lot of the products that are being entered some of it is definitely very impressive if you're lucky enough to get uh, introduced to that and so i i came to daniel and i said i wanted to do it and then when he gave me the green light to go ahead and do it i took that ball and i ran with it god dang this dj god dang this dj make my day the big event in cannabis when I was growing up was High Times Cannabis Cup, and they would do that every year in Amsterdam. There was a part of the whole business side that was really odd to me as a consumer at the time. When you were meeting these cannabis celebrities and people you looked up to, there was all this beef that was going on in the cannabis industry. Adam from TH Seeds, I heard, refer to it as potlitics. It seems so ridiculous from the outside looking in. These people were openly working in cannabis. They were growing weed for a living. Isn't this the most wonderful dream job that anybody could have? But somehow they all had these little chips on their shoulders to a certain degree, and it was kind of this whole shady side of the business. If you win a cannabis cup, you get to be a judge, so I got to see behind the doors and see that whole process. And the coolest part of the whole experience was getting a whole bunch of different weed, of course. <laughs> and being actually being chilling in what was called the judge house at the time um felt really exclusive you know uh hanging out with like method man and red man smoking weed with like famous people was kind of cool but you know it kind of occurred to me like coming from the perspective of a competitor that these people were just not qualified like it was a few of us winners and then like everybody else was just like buddies and stuff that had known certain staff members for a long time. There's a lot of events right now and they are a new thing for a lot of people. The High Times event is the one that's been around for the longest time and we're all just figuring it out as we go along and different people have different core ideals involved with when they're doing the shows, you know. Um, different people do it for furthering their companies or for some vision that they might have. But I think we have a really special place that we come from where we're doing it because we've attended and done all the other shows and we know what it is that we're missing. And we're trying to fill that gap for people and show everyone how great it can really be. Like you have, uh, like you have people like our, our boy Brett in Maine. Uh, he was the coordinator over in Maine and he started doing his own event out there at the same venue that he found this like cool little farm area and they have like a big barn where you can throw stuff in and like the owner smokes so it's cool yeah he started doing a community bonfire like two or three times a year and that's awesome you know um i'm very happy to inspire something like that and then you have the people that we inspired that only saw the expo part of it thinking like that was the thing right when our events like were about like a week or two weeks leading up to the, the actual public expo. The public expo was the award show that we also had boosts at, but that wasn't the thing, you know, that was the end of the thing. But they saw, they saw that and they were like, okay, we give, if we find a venue and make a swap meet, people will come. And that's good too, you know, that is good too. But this is like, you know, the, the lowest aspect of it all, the, the, the buying and the selling, not the hanging out, not the community. You might have a DJ or comedian making some jokes, but there's nowhere for you to sit. You walk around in a circle, you buy what you want, you go home. And that's cool too, that's cool too. Actually, it started when High Times started coming around. I think it was like 2010, 2011, um, High Times started coming to the US. The medical scene in California, and in Denver and Washington had, had progressed to a state to where they could hold competitions there. High Times is a different thing. I, I love it, I think it's cool, but it's just its own giant in itself, you know? And like, I think this is more like, like the best of the best type of deal, you know? Like, yeah, a lot of people compete in that, but this is where we like really get to go like this, you know? This man right here. You, you look on the board. I started going to the competitions um, and I had friends that owned different companies and I had helped them with different entries and or entered my own stuff and just kind of progressed from there. I started to make a name for myself when people started to see what I provided. You know, it's kind of funny, you know, 
what you find to be you know, everywhere, like for instance, in Southern California, if you go to LA, everyone has OG or grows OG. And then you go to somewhere like Denver or even the East Coast and th there's a lot of people who've never even tried it. And so, you know, you start to really open your eyes to a lot of people out there and where they're at and where they stand. And um, then CBD started to happen. And I, you know, I started to try to progress into CBDs and help as many people as possible. And, you know, when I started seeing when I was, I would go to a cup and have a booth and people would come up to me and say, Hey man, you know, that last drop you made here at so-and-so, you know, that really helps me with whatever ailment I have. And it was that right there was my motivation to continue with what I was doing and to go even harder and, and, and try to help as many people as I could make money doing it and, and feel good about myself. There's a lot of people that work every day and they make a lot of money, but they might not feel too good about what they do for a living. You know, like I don't have those issues. I feel great about what I do. There's a lot of people I help. Everything about their life and the people that love them is better. That's what pushes me forward. That's that right there is what makes me want to help as many people as I can and try to make sure that you know everyone understands that you know a lot of things have been purported a lot of way you know there's a lot of pharmaceutical drugs that really increase problems instead of alleviate them and, and cbds is a way for people to really change what's wrong with them change issues that they're having and alleviate symptoms and live a much better lifestyle because of it and you know it's it's just new it's just now coming forward we just now have the science behind it we just now have everything we need to progress forward and um and show people you know the science is there the more people that are helped the more people that lives are improved and the more people that see that is the change that we can make in the world you know we, we got to start with ourselves and, and hope that other people follow suit you know Definitely not my first Secret Cup. Uh, I heard about the Secret Cup a while ago, and then uh, finally they came to the East Coast, did the Secret Cup Beast Coast. It's when I entered in as Dabra Hashery Extracts and um, got to meet all the good boys at the Cup. The competition element of it is sort of like, it's like an American Idol um, of hash making. And now, the award for highest Terps surprisingly goes to a high CBD entry as well. Uh, number 17, Gilded Extracts for Remedy Sap for the highest Terps award. To compete in this event, each contestant only needs to provide 20 grams of concentrate or 60 grams of flour, evening the playing field for smaller producers. Their submission is broken down into judges' packs at intake and distributed just a few hours later. The competitors will have a week to sample all the entries before the award ceremony. Are you excited to judge it? Oh yeah, definitely. They will score the entries one to 10 in various categories. Some places have more competitors than others, but who will win is always a mystery. All that is known for sure is that the competition will be stiff between these masters of the cannabis craft. Everybody in this, in this competition was like, they, everybody knocked it out of the park. They're all there for a reason. It's all good. So it's, you know, they call it extract art for a reason because it's people's art. And, you know, it's, it's hard to say which one is better. You know, I, I was an attendee always at the original and uh, the Cannabis Cup in Amsterdam was the only event. You wait one year and you fly across the seas and you got to go to one event a year in Amsterdam. And, and uh, uh, now, now we're here. There's all kinds of events and it's all changing. And, and I think it's really, really great. When High Times started doing their events in the United States, they were now allowing the booths to sell cannabis. Uh, actually, a few other events did this too on a smaller scale, but High Times did it really big. And I remember going to that event and thinking, oh my God, this is really new and different from even the Amsterdam events. It still wasn't as cool as that experience really, but it was the best we got so far for the US. I'm one of very few people that got my love for events by going to events and being inspired and building these friendships. I think that's really unique. And most of the people that are involved in them now never spent a dollar to just go to enjoy the event without promoting some business or something entirely business related. Growing up not being part of anybody's tribe, 
feeling like you're an outcast and very different. Then you go to this event and there's all these different kinds of people, but they're somehow like you. And you start to feel like it's okay to be the way that I am and like these things that I like. And in fact, maybe I'm gonna get more into it. Start enjoying these things in a more celebratory way, not just in the shadows. And that shouldn't be something that you get only once a year in Amsterdam. When events started to happen in California, I was all for it. And I wanted to support all of those events and see where they went. But for High Times, there was a stigma that followed their competition. Over in Amsterdam, people had started to say that the competitions were fixed. And I can say the winners were not the authentic best in the competition. So how were they winning? These big companies, obviously people thought they were paying or cheating in some sort of way. And I have enough experience now that I can say that's not true. May have happened, but it was marketing that was mostly winning the events because it's much easier to convince people that you have the best than to authentically produce the best. And High Times got a bunch of bad press just because of the way their competitions worked. It was all about building your brand there. So these people would, like some of the, a lot of the attendees were, were fans of these hash makers. So they'd go out and they'd actually be able to meet them and dab their personal stuff and like form personal connections with these brands that, you know, sometimes they had, they'd already been supporting. Uh, sometimes that they had just seen and really wanted to try. This event, I'm all about having each event have their, have its own unique, you know, terms or, you know, judging rules or whatever, you know, like every event I liked that it, it's its own thing. Uh, and this clearly wasn't just like regurgitation of uh, high times or, anything like that it was its own unique thing from the get-go and like knowing jeremy and dan i know they just really care about hash and um you know like they're very caring people jeremy helps me with chalice you know the chalice festival and he does it for the community and he does it because he cares you know and uh that's what i love about these two guys you know what i mean they really uh they're fr it's from the heart we have a really good mix of people who compete and Everyone kind of works together to make the Secret Cup happen. Wasted to taste it. It's about to taste. And people bring all these great things to the table. They, they, for free, you know, they'll give their product or something from themselves and, and just to make it better for their city or the other people that are attending. And so, that's probably the thing that's the same and it's amazing that we are able to find these really unique and, and helpful people in every city that make it possible i think it's the bond with like the brothers that we have here with all the hash makers and the knowledge that actually is being spread amongst uh, amongst us now and well like i said 2012 was a lot different where people were i think scared to give their technique out and all these things because of business you know and now everyone i think is getting it like there's a lot of business and man, we can all teach each other and maybe grow from this. And at least that's where my mindset is. I, I can't really speak for everyone else, but I feel like if you want change, right, then that has to be within yourself. So if I really want something to be different, then I need to change it from right here. And that's what we're doing. I saw it as a networking event. A lot of people saw it as a party, uh, but this was like high level networking that was like causing lanes to open up all over the country. When we developed the event, we tried to think about the things that we didn't like, that uh, weren't just personal opinion uh, things that we didn't like about the other events. We tried to think fundamentally what was wrong with them. If we could improve the fairness, we wanted to make them more accurate representations of what our culture is really about. I've entered a lot of High Times Cups, I've entered a lot of different competitions, and what always ends up happening is nine times out of ten they hire someone like Wiz Khalifa or Snoop Dogg the judge, and he doesn't know a thing about growing. He may know what Weedy likes and what Weedy doesn't like, 
but he doesn't know anything about growing. And so you get a lot of things and, and like, for instance, it's a lot harder to take a week, a 16 week sativa full all the way, cure it properly and have it be dense, hard, resinous. That's a lot harder to do than it is to grow cookies at eight weeks, which frosts up for everyone. So, you know, there's a lot of things that aren't taken into consideration because the people judging aren't hands-on. When it comes to the secret cup, everyone judging is also entering. So they do this on a daily basis. They understand what to look for. They understand what not to look for, what they like, what they don't like. And it reflects in the judging, you know, nine times out of 10, you know, when you look at the people that win first, second or third place, they deserve to be there. And that's, that says something about the competition in and of itself. So when we were first doing the events, we had really a lot of support from everyone in the industry. So the well-known brands were entering, the well-known hash makers, all the biggest companies wanted to be a part of it. And then as we started doing the events and they couldn't even place in the top three, you started to realize these big brands had a lot to lose by entering these competitions with these smaller, more passionate growers and hash makers. And they were universally defeating these big companies at every event in every part of the country, even internationally. When we did our events in Spain and in Amsterdam, both times people from the UK traveled there and won the events. And there's no medical cannabis in the UK. There's no legal cannabis of any kind in the UK. So these people are risking their lives. And when they would show up at the event, they reminded me of all of our people in California. They were at that level. And you're going to start to see that as cannabis becomes more open. Without you guys in the community, we would not be able to throw an event anywhere. So give yourselves a big round of applause for being part of the Seven Cent community. Remember when we first started throwing them, we would put really, really, really long tables with like power outlets underneath the tables and set them up and like throw out like candy and waters and stuff for people just to go at it. Like we could have made so much more money. They wouldn't have remembered it the rest of their lives. And the people that got to go, remember it. This is why I wanted a secret cup here in DC. I have been traveling forever outside of DC, uh, going to cannabis cups, going to events, going to the West Coast where it's really you know, three times ahead of where we're at because you, know, you have the temperature, you have the ability for people to flex that uh, experience. And um, I wanted to see how that would happen over here. And I, just as I, you know, kind of saw it in my head, um, you know, first out of DC, you know, most of the things that you saw were just fairly okay and homegrown. Um, I wanted people to understand that there's more out there. Um, there's gold oils, there are, you know, trees that look like Christmas, you know, uh, uh, you know, a Christmas tree dusted in snow. The Secret Cup was like a, a party that made you feel exclusive just because you were there. Oh, I got it. I mean, it was something different, you know, than the High Times events, which I'd been to and I'm a fan of, I, I enjoyed it, but this was another level. You had a lot of the people that came out that were smokers that they just wanted to, you know, they did, just wanted to smoke weed and they weren't really about the higher end of things. And that's where the Secret Cup came into place, is that that's where it, it gave a place for people that were into that kind of stuff. So I asked Dan if I could, you know, put together a song for him. I wanted to do a top shelf song for appreciation and he said no I got this secret cup mixtape that I wanted to put out so you should do a song about the secret cup because we're about to start doing them in other cities and expanding so so I ended up putting together the secret cup anthem I came out to Denver for the finals and I had two verses done in the hook and I rapped it for Dan and Jeremy and they're like oh this shit is amazing I said all right I'll put together the third verse after the event from the experiences and that's really what it is it's just uh, the songs are all like a story of my life so this was what that was. It was just documenting my times at the Secret Cup. And especially that third verse was just like soaking up that finals event. Mortimer out there rocking her belt, that energy of everybody in the place just uh, having a great time. It's always peaceful. There's never problems at the events. 
just being around so many like-minded people, so many people that are into the same thing you are, that appreciate the same things you do. Um, and it's not just, it's not just the hash. I mean, it's, uh, it's everything else too. It's all the trappings of the culture. Um, intense love of glass art uh, that everybody shares. The uh, chance to meet people that are actually making medicine. The uh, chance to meet people that are actually making the glass art. So when, when we were doing the Seeker Cup, one of the things that I wanted to incorporate into it were some of the stereotypical things about cannabis that go along with the whole culture. I myself, I believe really strongly that um, cannabis and art are really closely connected. You've all heard stories of this musician talking about cannabis influencing their art. So we wanted to incorporate some of that into the Seeker Cup. We had live glass blowing at almost all of the events. And glass blowing for me is a really important part of the culture. For a long, long time, head shops were the main meeting point for stoners. When you got in trouble, a lot of times that was your only opportunity to still be in the cannabis industry in some sort of way. You could work at a head shop and that was okay. The glass, aspects of cannabis is, has been one of the things that pushed the culture forward. So, so glass was very simple in the very beginning. And as it has innovated and become more intricate and more diverse in the colors and all the different things, it's pushed the whole culture forward in a classy and really respectable way. The first secret cup I did was the first one they did in California. And um, I mean, that's one of my favorite memories, blowing glass live, because I've done it before, but for head shop owners, and they appreciate it, but this was a crowd of like virgin eyes for that kind of thing. So you had a, a whole bunch of people just staring at you. And I mean, I remember the event, the crowd was at the glass demo. I mean, that was where the most of the people that attended the event, they had music going on in the, the vendor booths with the different hashes and flowers and things to buy. And people were buying for sure. I'm, I'm sure it was a lucrative event for them. But I just remember seeing this like really big crowd of people that were all focused on us, taking pictures and videos. And um, I see the pictures from that event and I mean, it just looks cool. We were blowing glass in front of this huge, graffiti murals on these train tracks that were defunct um, but I mean we were literally set up on the train tracks and then the pictures are just really cool it wasn't a, a huge area so the crowd looks tight you know it looks like there's a lot more people there that may have been there but it was still a really large crowd super huge fan of glass blowing I grew up uh, around some really amazing glass blowers that I'm like in a way baffled that they're not taking advantage of all this, like what's going on around them, you know? And some of them have money and some of them are growing and whatever else, but I just, uh, I felt like they're like missing out on this like huge opportunity in the glass world right now. <laughs> and growing up, like even before I was really deep into the scene, like you would buy a glass pipe at, that you liked at a head shop or somewhere. It would have a special meaning to you because you would take it around throughout your life and you would have all these special moments that you shared with this piece and with other people. And it, it became kind of part of your whole journey. And then when you would break it, it was like a loss. It was a real tragic loss. And you would maybe buy a new piece or, or something like that and it would start a new journey. It was something that, um, you know, became really special. And, and as I learn more and more about glass, you know, I think that that is something that's underappreciated. People kind of don't even realize that they have this relationship with their glass pipe or their glass bong or whatever it is. I mean, I think that concentrates had a, a big role on how um, glass manufacturing has been changed. You've watched, you know, uh, pieces go from being the four foot bong to being the four inch rig, um, the, you, you, it's very hard to walk into a head shop and uh, find a piece that has a down stem for a flower bowl now. Everything's got a male ground joint for a dome or a domeless nail. Um, so it's, 
it's been interesting to watch it evolve and obviously the internet's had its role in that by giving everybody the immediate access to information um, where it would normally take word of mouth a long time to spread geographically the internet allows it to just spread like overnight i think th this is what's putting us uh the whole, the hash makers and all that kind of in the forefront and it's vice it's like we're piggybacking off each other because they go hand in hand and this revolution is like it's amazing glass had to change when the kind of hash that we smoked started to turn into a liquid and so the tools that were being used originally became much more diverse. And when we entered the Cannabis Cup, we were entering with one of the very first dabbing tools that were out there. And as time progressed, those tools have become so innovative that that original tool is basically obsolete. Nobody uses it anymore. Just hitting it purely off the, the titanium device all you were getting was that oil, and it was getting vaporized super quick. It wasn't smoke, it's not setting it on fire. You're just getting it so hot that it changes from a plasma to a gas, and you inhale it. And it bypasses your, the, the, the what is it, the blood-brain barrier, and just instantly high. And the thing is, it's really easy to, you know, sort of regulate your dosage, too. Uh, oh, you smoked on my dab. You smoke all of my dad. When dabbing came onto the scene, it really, uh, it changed everything. It gave us artists a new outlet to make things because now we're coming up with entirely new accessories that haven't been thought up before. All right, so this right here kind of changed everything for the glass industry. This is dabbing. What this is is, um, concentrated THC oil or hash oil and so we're heating up this nail which is made of quartz on one of our glass rigs and we get this nail nice and hot there's no combustion you're not burning any any plant material at all the first time I saw someone take a dab I was at uh, at Murr's house, and he's since passed away, but uh, he was a well-known glass blower in our industry. And um, I showed up at his house, and I see this torch in this rig just like that, except we had titanium at the time, and it was a swing. And they're heating it up and taking dabs, and I'm like, oh my gosh, are you guys doing drugs here? You know, that's what I was thinking, because, you know, I never associate cannabis with that kind of thought but yeah I didn't know what's going on and they explained to me the process and I mean it's like a whole different way to consume cannabis and now we have a whole different line of things we need to make we made these like swings um, it was basically a funnel that was bent and you'd sell these swings like this to other companies and they would wrap them with metal in fact um, this is one that um, was one of the first companies that kind of marketed the swings they asked me to make and I did pattern work ones and then I did these sculpted ones and looking back I mean these are really rough um, but what they were doing was wrapping this titanium pad around the swing or around the, the glass and calling it a swing because it swings back and forth so you'd heat this up and once it was glowing, you'd swing it back down and get your dab ready and you'd just drop it. And that's what this little opening was for. So you could get your dab tool in there and, and vaporize it. And you don't see um, very many people use, using the swings anymore. Um, you know, every now and then I probably make one a year. Someone will hit me up and they want like a classic rig. And so we started making the swings and then nails came out and domes. And uh, that's a whole thing that's like, come and gone like that that time that time it's weird because it's still so new um, but there's trends that have come and, and gone and now everyone uses some form of a banger and even those are becoming a little different and taking on different shapes and cannabis in general is just a very fast moving innovative business 
the thing that is popular this year might be completely obsolete by the end of the next year. So you have to stay on top of it really, really all the time. And having these events in all the different cities, that helped us to constantly be on the pulse of where cannabis was going. Now we're thinking. You know, the rigs and the dab scene is big. So a lot of the more higher end pieces are gonna be um, st uh, styled and engineered to do dabs. Whereas uh, a lot of the flower pieces are made differently. They have a different way the diffusers go in and things like that. It's because, you know, without the dabbing rigs, like I said, in 1999, we were making oil. There wasn't no dab rigs then though. Like we were pouring that shit on, on buds and like, killing our throat and lungs, and it was a horrible way to do oil. And some people tried to hot knife it and stuff, but um, I just think that that's, like I said, it's piggybacking off each other. So it's like a, it's a beautiful dynamic, you know? Like, it's, it's future, it's what it is, you know? I think vaporizing the oil and stuff is the future. Like, no more smoking the flower. And I love flowers to death, but I just really feel like vaporizing, even vaporizing flower, I guess, is better than not, you know? I think dabbing is still the future, dude. I, there's all these youngsters that want to be a part of it still, like haven't got to experience all this, you know? And now these certain states are becoming 21 years of age to, to partake. These kids are like, wow, I can't wait to be 21. People need to see that the, the stuff, if it's made properly, it, it's not dangerous. And in fact, uh, can really approach like connoisseur grade levels. Um, I want people to know what's possible. like the magic that you can get out of this plant. Um, I want people to know how to smoke it, know how to judge the quality of it, um, have better access to meds wherever they're from. Um, I want all that stuff to happen. So when you attended a secret cup, a lot of times you're being exposed to the next new trend in cannabis. People would show up to the secret cup and uh, sometimes they would have worked on something for like, you know, maybe a year long and they'd have this wonderful story of the plant that they grew or where their concentrate came from. Sometimes it was like a new technique. And I've even had, you know, my eyes opened on things that I didn't think were possible. Like I've had a alcohol extraction oil that was phenomenal tasting. And, you know, there's just been nu numerous things that, um, even me, as somebody who had experienced quite a lot in cannabis, I constantly am having my eyes open to new things. And I love that about the Secret Cup, the innovation, the real innovation, because people that were into that whole part of the events, um, the, the Secret Cup was the kind of event that attracted a true cannabis connoisseur, somebody that had really learned the history. and. A lot of people that were doing really, really cutting edge innovation. That's what I love about these two guys. You know what I mean? They really, uh, they're fr it's from the heart, you know? And uh, that's, I feel a little more rare, you know, in, in uh, industry events or whatever, that it's from someone from the movement, from the industry, it's from, you know, the soul. And uh, I think everybody notices that. Um, and, and the energy the event has now and like, it means something to win the event. And if I don't win first, second, or third, or any anything, um, at least I got to present myself and my side of the story and, and show people um, maybe something that they haven't had the opportunity to try. And you know that's a win to me. But you know, winning, actually winning, that would be a large statement to where the cannabis industry is progressing and how much extract artists care about quality clean meds because when you enter a solventless entry it's zero ppm it's zero it's zero you know solvent is there's no nothing that can harm you and so when you have something as loud as my entry and, and as flavorful as my entry you know and 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 to have them recognize that recognize what it is as a medicine and vote for me to win that would be probably one of the highlights of my life. I'd be really stoked, not just for myself, but for the cannabis industry and where we stand as extract artists. I don't want it to get big. 
a lot of the other events, their goal is to get bigger and make more money. And that's never been my goal. Uh, my goal has been to provide the best experience for the people that attend the event. And as we've done the events, I know where we're lacking and I know where we're strong. And I just want to focus on those kinds of things and bring to the people some more of the experiences that they're looking for. That's one of the hardest things is uh, the budget that we're facing. But I believe that people see what we're trying to do now, and that's going to open the doors to a much greater experience for all the people involved. Um, I'm really excited that, you know, I think the face of the Secret Cup's changing a little bit. And the more knowledge, the more things that are like this, we get to express it to each other, you know. I really want to break new ground. So uh, I, I like to do different things with the events. If I keep getting caught up in the same pattern, uh, a lot of times that can be not so fun, you know. Um, the other thing is I want to see everybody uh, happy and I want to push the education. So this message that we've got, I want to get to everyone. And it's difficult, you know, we don't have the platform to speak just yet. And we're slowly building, you know. I would recommend it to anybody who's a, a connoisseur or someone who strives to know what real uh, medicine in the cannabis community is. Um, there's a lot of people that try to pass off, um, you know, nug run or these other terms of what high quality things should be when they're really not anywhere close to it. And the competitors are a good example of what the perfect concentrates or what we strive to have should be like and what real medicine should for, be for people that need it, you know? And uh, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. I'm gonna actually take, take one down. I'm over here. The goal was to make it a part of regular life, and we were successful, and it is now. But what was special was the fact that we were on the fringes, on the front lines, making something happen for the first time, um, and that there was risk involved, and that was exciting. Hey, how's it going, everyone? Uh, I just started uh, fresh off the butt extractions a little while ago. Uh, first, I want to foremost thank uh, Dan and Nicotine for hosting this event. There have been a number of times in my career in the cannabis industry where I almost had to pinch myself, where I, I'm like, think about what you're doing. Think about where you are. I mean, the only way I could compare it is it's like having like a rock star lifestyle. You're like traveling to these strange, unknown places. People are like bringing you into like these grows or these, you know, farms that they don't bring people into. And then I'm gonna bring them attention. This is some sort of value, a new value to their company that wasn't something that existed before. And here I am, thankfully, I am an authentic cannabis fan so they could talk to me and, and know that I'm truly passionate about everything. And they felt a lot more comfortable bringing me into these places, but it was strange, you know? You could feel the danger in some of the situations, you know? And I'm in Oakland going to this different place or that different place. And, you know, here I am, you know, little me, and uh, some of these people are heavily armed. Um, going to other countries like Spain, dealing with the military police in Spain, like they have cannabis over there, but they, they don't necessarily have like legal cannabis the way that we have. So it's constantly an evolving process. And you know, it's, it's stressful. And a lot of times you're hating it. A lot of times you're thinking, I should have done a regular job, that these risks that I'm taking are not worth it, that I'm not getting financially something that's gonna get me set up for life out of this. This is just some sort of like passionate thing that I've got myself into because of how much I believe in this. You know, for some reason, a lot of credit comes my way. 
but the fact of the matter is the the secret cup wouldn't exist the uh, I wouldn't have been able to accomplish any of this without Jeremy I mean he has a he has a mind for events and he puts in all the tough work and anytime he needs uh, someone needs to be an asshole like this guy is the one who does it <laughs> you know you question well, I think it's pretty normal to have those moments but it's also pretty awesome to have those triumphs when you've won or you've, you've done something, especially the events, like we've thrown an event in some sort of unique place and people have like won awards. It's been this really wonderful thing for a lot of people and a really amazing adventure. You feel a triumph that's not really explainable. I mean, I vacationed to Amsterdam many times. When I threw an event in Amsterdam, I felt like a totally different feeling. And those kind of things are really special. I'm glad to have been a part of it. And I think even just for the people that attend the events, that they've had some of those really special moments too. Local laws are what determines what we're able to do as far as an event goes, because we don't want to run afoul of them. So that determines how, you know, like any kind of distribution if possible happens. That determines whether we have a big uh, expo that's public or we have a small private event like this one. Um, Vegas laws right now, until they go fully uh, recreational, means that, you know, we can totally rent a house and have a private event, but we can't, you know, like just invite the public to it because uh, they had an event here recently and uh, totally had cops show up to it, shut down the medicating area. They weren't quite down with it yet. Yeah, that was a, that was a message. You know, one of the things also at the Seeker Cup was because we were experts at all this stuff. You know, we might be consuming these large amounts, but the idea was not to be like trashy about it. It was to be classy about it and to show that cannabis didn't have to be this like get fucked up and be a mess, you know, like this stereotypical negative thing that a lot of people look at it as, that you could enjoy it and still be like a functioning adult and do all kinds of things. I mean, there, there's a lot of things you can do to like leave a good impression on the city that you're working with. Um, one thing that we did in Rhode Island that worked really well is we went to the city government, we told them exactly what we were gonna do. We broke it down for them, they were completely on board. We got all the permits we needed and we were able to, on top of all that, um, raise a whole bunch of stuff for the homeless. So we had people bringing food and clothes and we had two truckloads full of stuff that we dropped off to the local um, homeless shelter. Even with the Seeker Cup, I will say, like, as, as bad as the situation was with the law enforcement, my interactions with them were all fine. You know, nobody did anything to me that was inappropriate. They definitely put a lot of attention on events simply because we were smoking cannabis there. And that was the entire reason they had a problem with our event. We could have done almost the exact same event minus the actual cannabis part of them and they would have had no problem with the event. The problem was the smoking cannabis part. Not even the sales. The sales, obviously, I could see sometimes those being problems, you know, or issues. Ah, uh, that was not the issue. The issue was smoking cannabis. And that to me is staggering. I, I can't believe that that's still a problem. Uh, people don't see all the wrestling that we have to do with regulations and laws. Um, when we throw one of these events, we have to contract a lawyer and make sure that it's even possible to do it, first of all. Um, then it comes to actually putting the event together. That means that we have to like raise a lot of money and we have to have the trust of the community in order to do so. Primarily what pays for these events is people that pay for the enhanced experience of like, you know, the, the chance to come to the VIP event, the chance to get a gift bag, that kind of thing, the chance to try the entries, you know, they're, they're all paying extra for that stuff. And we use that money that we raise from them to like throw this event. We don't have major sponsors. We're, we're a grassroots event. And so as far as manpower goes, uh, we have a lot of volunteers, a lot of people that really believe in this. They might not be able to shell out the $300 necessary to get a ticket, but you know, they are definitely willing to put their heart and you know, their, their efforts into making sure the event goes well. 
Like we have people doing like web work, photography, uh, people that are cooking, people that are serving, people that are cleaning up, people that are running errands and putting out any fire that pops up. So it's a 100% it's a a group effort. It's like, you know, the family comes together and then we get it done. The very first Seeker Cup was targeted to just kind of be one event. And then as I wanted to do my own event in Los Angeles, other people that had gone to the first one wanted to do their own in their own cities too. But they were having trouble. So Dan contacted me, brought me on. So from that point on, I became involved with throwing all of the events all over the world. And ultimately, I'm the only person that was at every Secret Cup in every city, in every state, in every country. And that's actually a very proud accomplishment. And one of the best adventures of my life. Everywhere we went, people would just, you know, jump in and help out. Like when we had the Beast Coast thing, um, we ordered hundreds of lobsters. And it just turned out that we had a chef there, who's now one of my good friends, Ben, uh, <laughs> had a chef there with his knives and stuff, and he started cooking them for everybody, you know? It was that it was that level of, of pitching in all the time. Everybody was just, everywhere we went, like we had people just step up and help out, give us places to stay, drive around, work for free. I mean, there's so many people, like, uh, yeah. everyone we did. It was a community, and like we really, what we did was facilitate you know, everybody coming together. That's what we did. You know, we we created a lane and everybody else had to pitch in the work. So eventually there were little events that just focused on money-making, vending aspects of the event scene. And they started popping up every day, basically. And there were huge concert-based events every month or so. When we were first doing the events, and this is also true for Chalice. Uh, we had the community all coming together. It was really a special thing. It was a whole movement. It was incredible. And we were powerful. But as these things happen and people would go to all these other events all the time, we lost that feeling that what we were doing was something special. And now most of the other events are gone. In fact, there's only a handful of events all over the world that I really think are worth going to. Uh, it seemed that as time went on, there was less of an interest from the community um, to, to help. And we had always relied on the community's help. It's one thing to find a, a venue that is making no money and you're gonna give them thousands of dollars to like use their event space for a big ass event. Like that's a little easier, it seemed like over time than finding an intimate space for a hundred friends to hang out. You know, like Airbnb was up on the whole party thing. Um, it just got harder and harder to do the VIP stuff to like put out the money ahead of time. You know, I've been to a lot of these things since the first one in Seattle that uh, I was able to go to. And there was kinks then too, you know what I mean? But it just, you know, you learn to expect it. And it's, you know, it's a bunch of stoners putting together a party, you know what I mean? So. As we were doing the Seeker Cup, we ran into all these problems, all these different ways and one that was common was legal problems with the police. From the first event in Los Angeles, we had police called in who showed up in riot gear. That same year, we had issues with them in San Francisco involving our venue, and we had to switch that last minute. That happened often. The worst time was probably Colorado, where it happened twice in a week, and we had to switch cities, because at one venue, I had to talk to detectives who had a file on us. The second event in Arizona was the only event they forced us to cancel. But in Humboldt, they showed up to the second event with canine units and wanted to arrest everyone they could. In Spain, they met me as I was exiting the plane with my picture and wanted to look through my luggage because all the trophies and prizes made them suspicious of me. The last event we even did had a local cannabis advocacy group take a public stand against the event simply for coming to their town. There were so many times we had to deal with problems like these. All of it made it really difficult to continue with the events. And it also led us to having to do refunds and cover losses from dropouts and deal with all the negativity surrounding all those kinds of things. Caught a few people trying to cheat and the support from the community just became much less. We weren't making a bunch of money. 
or doing these events for the love of cannabis and recognizing the really true achievement and innovations in the cannabis industry. When we started to run into so many problems, especially financially, and people just not appreciating what we were trying to do, we decided to stop doing it. To sum it up, there's, there's two aspects of how we inspired people. We inspired people with the spirit of the Secret Cup and we inspired them with the business of the Secret Cup. The spirit of the Secret Cup was, for me, um, it was freedom. It was like, it was almost like being a kid again. You know, it was like a, a summer camp, like a getaway, um, like a convention for a very niche society of people that were making hash for um, for the community that had built fans that were like celebrity chefs that were, you know, had some notoriety. So it, we were able to just bring all these people together and it was great, you know, and that, that, that was the best part of it for me. They, you know, you, you do stuff, you do at other events, listen to music, like uh, eat food, like all that stuff. But you know, the, the love of the cannabis was like why everybody was there and that was great. That was great. Does that live on? It sure does live on, but in, but not like it was. Now that it's been a couple years since we've done an event, right around the time we did the campouts, there is a group of people who start talking about doing another secret cup. When I run into people at other events, it's very common for them to tell me about how their company owes some of their success to the secret hub in some way. They got their first booth there, or they made some important connection, and the love for the positive experiences is still strong. And that makes me super happy for all those people who are still doing it. And, and Big D, you made it all possible for me, so thank you very, very much. I really appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. But yeah, the, you know, there were more events after this. We inspired a lot of people to do this on their own. In fact, like one thing that I said, every one of the cups we had was like, look, we did this, we're just like you, do this too. You know, like give your people a place to buy better medicine cheaper, you know, directly from the people that are making it. Build these relationships that will carry over after legalization and after the chads come in and steal it from you, you know? Um, I really did my best to like spread those seeds everywhere I went. And like, we didn't even like ask for credit from anybody. A lot of times people get really upset and they start to see into things that aren't there. And then they start to believe these stories that they've kind of created for themselves. Like we had people that entered our event lots of different times and they never won, you know? They get really frustrated. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to accept that you just aren't doing the best work that's out there. It's a lot easier to say that there's some sort of conspiracy against you and that's why you're not winning. Anytime that you do something that somebody else isn't doing, uh, even if it's a failure, it's still a progression because in that failure, you're going to learn from it and you're going to learn something that you would have never learned had you not taken the step anyway. So, so anything that, that's a progression towards what something that hasn't been done before, in my mind, is, is an advancement towards, uh, towards something better, even if it's not something that you initially recognize as better. We were operating in a gray area between medical and recreational. Uh, they passed these laws and they were not very specific. So you kind of had a blanket protection in order to put one of these on. Like a lot of times, like the local authorities didn't even want to bother with us, you know? We put this together with our friends, you know? We made a movement that attracted people from all over the country and all over the world, that built up the mythos of the subculture to the point where it entered popular culture, um, but at the, the end of the day, we didn't have the resources to go on anymore, so we had to stop. You know, the, the movement still goes on. There are still other events that are kind of doing similar things to what we were doing, and, and some of the people that used to attend our events are, are headlining those uh, other events in other places, but it's not the same. I think this is one of the 
best events out there. I really think that, you know, we would love to, to, to have more people that are purists and, and people like us, like-minded people get involved all over as, as we're opening up the doors in the United States for mar uh, legal marijuana. I think it's also going to open up the doors for more people to become family in the secret cup. So yeah, I would recommend it. I would uh, love to see this family grow. The best part about the secret cup is how it brings all the like-minded individuals together, uh, kind of in a form of unity. And it's not so much about the commercialization. It's more about the art. It's more about the product. Um, it's more about uh, the sense of community. You know, everybody's going to have a good time no matter what, because we're all here together, you know? So all that, all that small stuff doesn't really matter. We all, we all made it here. We all, we're all having a good time. You know, it's, it could be stressful because of the logistics side of things, but in the end, it, it always comes together. I just, I love everybody gathering. And really, man, this, this shit's like, <laughs> It's like being in some magical wonderland that people just don't, I mean, when my friends and my folks hear about how, what we're, how we're getting down out here, they just can't believe it, you know? It's nuts, they see the videos, it's, it's really cool. It's a blessing to be a part of all of this. And I can only relate it to when I was younger, I thought, man, if we could only live in the times of when the hippies were doing, you know, the 60s, the 70s, the Woodstock days, how crazy that must have been. I'm like, where are we? I think we're in that like blip of, of our 60s, 70s, and it's just, cool to be a part of this, have so many of the homies get down that, that we do get down with and uh, you already know it's just it's just the beginning, it's gonna keep going. Secret Cup to infinity and beyond. Yeah I mean dude it just it erupted into its own thing. The cannabis scene from place to place is unique and wonderful. They have their own genetics, they have their own heroes, their own uh, soldiers, they, they have their activists. There are really wonderful things going on all over the country, all over the world. And when you go to these other places and you start to learn these stories, and part of the story is the culture of the place that you're in, and part of the story is the cannabis history that is from this location and, and surrounding all of these kind of uh, genetics and these different growers and um, hash makers. All of that stuff is so rich. And for me as a cannabis enthusiast, a true person that love cannabis, like going to these places and hearing these stories and meeting these people, it was awesome for me. And just as cool as it was for them to be a part of our event, it was cool for me to be a part of their history and their culture. One thing I wanna communicate is like, the best thing about it all for me um, wasn't the, the cannabis, it was the freedom. It was like traveling to a different city and people there, you know, greeting us warmly and giving us gifts and feeding us and taking to their, us to their favorite spots and showing us their zones like only a local could. Local people that would hear that you're coming out and they would want to take us to their grow or they would want to take us to some really local special food spot. And, Sometimes it had nothing to do with cannabis. They just wanted to show us the history of the town. And I loved it. It was so wonderful. I, I enjoyed that probably the best out of all the things that we did. I love that shit. I loved it. That was my favorite part. I'm glad to see you all out here and supporting. Uh, this is what we wanted to do. We want to spread the movement. You guys all get it. This is, this is a medical event too. So I, I really want to thank all you guys that are patients. I really believe in uh, the medical value to what we do here. It's uh, pretty commonly known that having friends and having a good social life is healing for people. And uh, they're constantly kind of trying to keep us away from each other. They don't want us to be friends. I don't know what it's about, but uh, we're all here together and we're forming a family and they're not gonna be able to keep us apart. So thank you guys all for being out here and uh, I hope you had a great time. When we first did the events, you know, people were very skeptical about our ability to do them and, and the whole thing, and they would have a lot to say. And then as we were doing them and people were having these amazing, wonderful times and there were these colossal successes, people wanted to get on board and become supporters. And so we had, some people kind of just had play on our name. You know, they started their own event and it had a similar name to our event. 
But that ultimately resulted in people just straight up stealing our name. And there were multiple events in other countries that were just called the Secret Cup that we had no affiliation with at all. And I guess that's flattering. And kind of now where I'm standing, I, I'm ready to give the, the title of Secret Cup to the, to the world and everyone can go throw their own Secret Cups. And, you know, I wish everyone all the success and all the happy times that we had. Okay, let's get to it. Like, we were really lucky that we got to do it in the right time and we did it in the right time. And we, a lot of people made a lot of connections and we all made a lot of memories and we all made a lot of friendships. But the thing we did could only happen in the time period that it happened. And I'm glad we made it happen. Welcome to the cup. I'm so glad that you made it. From LA to NY, we all getting faded. All across the nation, tell me who got the best. The top shelf extracts. I won't settle for the rest. No, it's gotta be that proper. Give me high as helicopters. Chest thumping like a chopper, coughing like I need a doctor. Talking slow like a mobster, leaning low in my chair. Thinking, what should I hit next? Could get high off the air. Dabbing with the judges, extract extraordinaire. Tangy to the TI Terps, got them well aware. Highly educated, top notch dabbing there. You damn right we faded, but I still hit. I ain't scared. Call me Mr. Dabalina, Mr. Glob Dabalina. The 91 ISO got the rig looking cleaner. Dab bar, do it big. Where's my number? Have you seen her? That's the game of the event, and most will never find her neither. No. Welcome to the Jeremy. Nobody tells him about this. <laughs> this is what you don't see at the secret house. 